Let me let me let me give myself. Are they scientists or are they doctors? That's what I'm asking. The attendees well uh, are scientists and doctors and professors are there. Okay, right. So I'll, I'll get started then if that's all right. Okay, sure. And yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll change slides. Okay. Next slide, please. Can I take over the control of the slides? Yeah, just put the whole, yeah, fine. Okay, so good morning. I'm uh, Dr. De Silva. I'm a senior lecturer at Sunderland University. Uh, and uh, Alice, if you can go back to the previous two slides. Go back, please. Thank you. So I'm a, a senior lecturer at Monkey North Hospital in Sunderland. I'm, uh, the reason I'm talking to you is I'm a functional doctor. That's different from the normal allopathic doctors who work in hospital and also different from public health doctors. Uh, so allopathic doctors make diagnosis and select treatments and follow up. Uh, public health doctors look at uh, general populations in terms of toxins and uh, environmental hazards. And, uh, Right. Um, uh, is it okay for me to carry on speaking, Chair? Yeah. Okay. Who are the two gentlemen? There? Are you joint joint chairs? I can't hear you. Actually, the chair is uh, Doctor Sinari Kaya, but then he's. I think he's not available. I think he's. Uh, All right. Okay. So. So um, can I just keep talking then? In that case, can can I also try and control my my slides? Is that possible? Yeah. yeah uh, Alice, I will do that. I will do that. I will do that. Person. Okay. Right. So um, so I'll discuss. Uh, if you can put this to all the slides. Hello, doctor. I have given the request for you. P please, you can control your screen. Now, yes, okay. Okay. Did you got the pop up? Right. There's view options. Give up remote control. Is that right? Oh, top is okay. I'm looking for the days when we can actually go back live and speak to people face to face. Then all these troubles are over, isn't it? Really? Right. It's going to be fun. Right, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the uh, the virus Corona uh, and Corona spike protein, which uh, is used to lock into this ACE2 protein in the cell membrane. And, uh, and uh, I can't control the slides, I'm afraid. Thank you. So where do I, do I start again? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you, doctor. Okay, right. So, uh, can you pull up the slide before? First slide, please.
the one before that thank you so as i was saying i'm i'm a functional doctor and the the sub specialties within functional doctoring is to do with cell biology immunology and nutrition those are the three things functional doctors deal with and what they are trying to do in functional medicine is to try and explain to patients and other doctors the overall picture to try and get some stability in the body systems that's really what functional doctoring is all about it's different from allopathic doctoring where um, the uh, doctor makes a diagnosis and selects treatment uh, to essentially to uh, alleviate symptoms and uh, hope for the best really and the other type of doctors is public health doctors who look at whole populations and look at uh, potential toxins and uh, infestations and try and do some uh, major activity trying to reduce or get rid of those toxins and environmental pollutants so that's really where i'm coming from next slide please and if you can put the whole slide up yeah so these are the five things i'm going to talk about i'm going to talk about uh, the uh, covid-19 virus um, and the spike protein and the uh, protein called ace2 which it block uh, locks into and the anchoring points in the cell membrane called tnprss2 which is basically assisting the spike protein to lock to the ace2 membrane protein and also there's another protein called furin a furin cleavage site uh, i'll talk a bit about that i'll talk about uh, immune dysregulation involving t cells and this famous cytokine storms which the t cells cause when they are alerted too late if you like to what's going on um then i'll talk a bit about angiotensin and uh, reactive oxygen species accumulation i think that's the basis of my talk ros accumulation that's really uh, probably bread and butter stuff for you i hope uh, and talk a bit about bradykinin there's another storm called bradykinin storm which uh, which uh, is consistent with the symptoms of uh, covid-19 uh, phase 2 which is when people end up in hospital i talk a bit about nutrition in terms of vitamin d deficiencies and potential prophylactic use of vitamin d and i finally talk about vaccines the different types rna strains versus um uh, viral uh, epitopes and live attenuated virus next slide please so what we knew about cell biology before covid-19 uh, so next slide yeah so basically there is a uh, kind of diagrammatic representation of the virus attaching itself through the spike protein head to the ace protein on the cell membrane and then there is this uh, anchoring protein called tnprss2 which assists the uh, the spike protein to lock in to the ace2 protein um we also know that there is a furin uh, protein bit like tnprss which is used in the aids virus to uh, assist the virus getting into the cell next slide please so this is a, a, a diagram about the checks and balances of the immune system involving t cells and if you remember t naive t cells are produced in the bone marrow apart from this one type of t cell called t regulator cells in the green which is produced by the thymus the thymus also produces naive t cells so you start with naive t cells and then uh, when you get instructions from the macrophage cells which pick up stuff circulating or in cells uh, which are the triggers like bacteria or antigens they engulf it and then show it to the dendritic cell which then shows it to the naive t cell and then the naive t cell becomes activated and produces t1 t2 t17 and t regulator cells so t1 and t2 are the mainstay of the t cell response uh, t1 is a more inflammatory pathway and an immediate pathway uh, and it responds to that by viruses and bacteria and uh, and if it goes too high too strongly it drives autoimmunity t helper cell 2 is the antibody producer and it mainly deals with 
uh, extracellular parasites uh, or whatever uh, viruses which are known to the system. And there should be a, a, a balance between the levels of Th1 and Th2 normally. Um, unfortunately, in some people, I think you have heard of tired T cells and it's the T helper one cells which are tired uh, to a lesser extent T helper two cells, but that's what tired T cells are about. Then there's a further uh, T helper cell called TH17, which is predominantly present in the gut, in the gut lining, and also in the skin. And uh, that uh, produces cell mediated immunity and, uh, and is particularly with fungi and parasites and is also inflammatory in nature. And that is in balance with the, the, the fourth type of T cells called T uh, regulator cells. So it's very Hello? Hello? Hi, Sabina, can you come up, please? Can you get instructions to come up, please? I'm uh, giving the talk at the moment, all right? Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so T regulator cells are, should be in balance with T helper cells. And again, uh, immune dysregulation is the name of the game in terms of viral infestations. Next slide, please. So let's start talking about reactive oxygen species. So reactive oxygen species are a byproduct of uh, us trying to make energy, uh, trying to make ATP in both in uh, the mitochondria and the, uh, in, the, in the cytoplasm. Um, and reactive oxygen species is a byproduct. It is actually uh, helpful in some situations at a low dose. It promotes cell pro proliferation. It is good at uh, uh, sending signals to other cells. It is good at helping cell differentiation and growth. Um, but it's the bad side is that if you accumulate too much ROS, reactive oxygen species, you're going to get uh, more damage in terms of various things like cardiovascular disease, protein deficiencies, uh, cell death, all the kind of uh, non-communicable disease we know of, arthritis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, asthma, COPD, uh, thyroid disease, uh, dementia, delirium, and also depression, uh, they are, and not to mention cancer. So if you get ROS accumulation, all kinds of nasty things happen, but at a low dose, ROS is good for you in terms of uh, helping signal trans, uh, passing signals from one side to another. Next slide, please. So this is what happens when you get a collection of ROS. Oxygen uh, gets converted to uh, activated oxygen and then hydrogen peroxide and then that gets uh, hopefully broken down into water. That's a normal kind of pathway. So the clearance of uh, uh, activated oxygen and hydrogen peroxide is uh, through the various enzymes. And there are things like uh, superoxide dismutase, uh, catalase, xanthine oxidase, NADPH oxidase, and, uh, and those kind of enzymes, which actually need uh, certain minerals to work like manganese, zinc, things like that. But the point is trying to clear these to produce water. And uh, the problem is that if for various reasons, there's accumulation and this process doesn't work properly. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, um, so this is trying to point out that our previous understanding that uh, obesity, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, all that kind of stuff was primary to reactive oxygen species. It looks like ROS is the higher up one in the chain that actually causes obesity and dys, uh, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes, okay? And if you can, uh, if you can just see on the bottom of the screen, uh, I put in air pollution, and that's the bit I'm going to talk about next. But I've said in to the, the way to balance out excess reactive oxygen species is NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine exercise, uh, which particularly this thing called high intensity interval training, 
and also uh, having a good night's sleep is helpful in terms of antioxidant capacity and clearly reactive oxygen species. Next slide, please. So this is a picture of what you commonly see in New Delhi and also in uh, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, London, uh, uh, what, what, in, in China, in the big cities of China, and uh, where, where the infection first started allegedly. Uh, and that's called photochemical smog. And that consists of various particles produced by uh, machinery, uh, industry, cars, things like that, nitrogen oxide, acid droplets, and these microparticles, which could be anything from uh, from uh, carbon particles, from diesel engines to um, kind of various uh, allergens, uh, pollen, pollens, and things like that. And the the worry even before uh, SARS-CoV-2 came along is that this is really nasty stuff in terms of accumulating reactive oxygen species. But uh, a bit of exciting news was that uh, there was a suggestion uh, by one of my Sri Lankan contract triads working in London uh, in meteorology that uh, viruses can piggyback on these microparticles and get sucked up to the clouds and then dump down again, uh, causing serious infestation. Next slide, please. So no surprise when uh, this uh, pandemic happened that it happened in uh, big cities where there was a lot of uh, uh, smog, basically, pollution, which is what happened in effect. If you think about uh, China in the places where the uh, pandemic started, northern Italy, uh, New York, London, uh, Brazil, places like that, high in pollution, which is quite, which was quite important. And that was quite a controversial thing to say at the time. But also another controversy was this furin uh, protein in the cell membrane. Uh, now that was a, a, a protein which uh, we knew about from AIDS, from HIV, but what uh, we found looking at the uh, genome of this new virus, SARS-CoV-2, was that this uh, there was a capacity for furin to act on the uh, on the spike protein of the virus. So actually, that was an additional uh, anchor point to make it easier for this virus to get into uh, the uh, the the the, uh, the 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 uh, nasal membranes, nasal surface uh, membranes, and the, the 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 lung tissue. And there was a huge controversy, if you remember, that this was a lab-produced virus because the furin component was there, and uh, that's called uh, enhancement of function gain of function, which uh, every lab in the world who is doing virus research is doing, which is trying to make a, a fairly uh, mild virus more serious so that they can test various vaccines against it. And there was a massive controversy right at the beginning because the Nobel laureate who discovered HIV stated that this was a lab produced virus, which may or may not be. Uh, evolution can easily add in the furin component just as well. If it's, for example, if it's in bats, the virus can uh, live in bats and then um, uh, then uh, evolve by using a furin to make it more potent, if you like, to get into uh, the respiratory tissue. Next slide, please. So these, uh, you know, it is absolutely right to say that this virus is small beer in terms of how many people it can kill. So, I mean, the, if you look down on the, the row from the bottom, COVID-19 is the kind of pinkish bit. So it's, it's kind of compared to bubonic plague and, uh, and the Spanish flu and things like that. In terms of actual kind of mortality, infection fatality rate, it is quite small, but I have lost five patients in, in during the first wave and uh, and it was a horrible way to die. The, the problem is people do die much less, but when they die, they die quite badly, very similar to the Spanish flu. The lungs fill up with fluid, they feel like they're drowning, and that's, uh, so it is actually an unpleasant thing to watch and unpleasant thing to go through compared to the ordinary uh, 
uh, ordinary flu where it is very gentle and people die very quickly without actually a lot of distress. Next slide, please. And just put all the points just to make it easier for me. Okay, right. Um, so, uh, as, as I said, SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 protein and it reduces the availability of the ACE2 protein. ACE2 is necessary to convert angiosentin 2 to angiotensin 1-7. And this is part of the normal green angiotensin pathway. When you get collection of angiotensin 2, it becomes pro-inflammatory and increases this stuff called reactive oxygen species. Whereas angiotensin 1-7 suppresses ROS, for example, ROS being superoxide and uh, hydrogen peroxide. So angiotensin receptor, which, uh, uh, which binds to the angiotensin 2, and the combination of that produces this thing called bradykinin storm, which is characterized by vasoconstriction, particularly in the pulmonary vasculature, a bit like uh, altitude sickness, pulmonary edema, and oxidative stress. Virus doesn't stop there. The virus then enters the endothelial cells of the blood vessels, the tiny capillaries surrounding the alveoli. And we know that selenium and vitamin D are protective. It stops the virus entering endothelial cells. When it doesn't enter these cells, it releases this protein called von Willenbrand's protein, which along with factor eight causes platelet adhesion. And that's why you get the kind of micro thrombi showing up uh, with the patients with COVID-19. And that's particularly the pulmonary capillaries, which shows up in terms of the kind of ground glass appearance on, on CT and X-ray, but it affects the kidneys and periphery. So these patients, if you have seen patients who are who are got uh, COVID-19, they have uh, cyanosed fingers and toes, one of the earliest signs of that. But unfortunately, it doesn't stop there because clots become much bigger, involving the big vessels, the veins and the arteries, so that causes pulmonary emboli and also causes strokes. That's how people die. It's not necessarily the bradykinin storm. It's not even necessarily the uh, trouble with the uh, pneumonitis. It is the coagulopathy which kills people. Next slide, please. So in summary, SARS-CoV-2 was the last straw. The patients who were at risk had already had accumulation of reactive oxygen species. They had their hypertension, their diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and obesity. The last bit of even more accumulation of ROS caused the death, in effect, by coagulopathy. coagulopathy. And, uh, and it, it's uh, obvious that uh, you know, these people were deficient in manganese, zinc, copper, and NSE. So they didn't have the antioxidant uh, uh, balance, if you like, to deal with the ROS. So that's how, you know, that was the last straw. Next slide, please. So just briefly talking about prophylaxis, this is where uh, functional doctoring comes in. And the main thing uh, functional doctors talked about, next slide, please. And put all the, all the points in. So one of the things functional doctors got involved in is this argument about the need for uh, maximizing vitamin D3. Vitamin D deficiency is present in 40% of adults worldwide and 70% of uh, BAME, black population in Europe, and also in elderly, obese, and pregnant women. D deficiency is worst in late winter and early spring uh, because of the lack of sunlight, lack of ultraviolet B. Uh, when we look at COVID-19 admissions, uh, low vitamin D is associated with high mortality, but also more likelihood of getting into ventilation, longer duration of stay, and uh, yeah, three, three things, high mortality, longer duration of stay, and more likely to get into ventilation. However, despite that, the WHO and NICE have stated there's no evidence for prophylaxis and treatment for COVID-19. Take on what that you may. Uh, vitamin D is a steroid hormone. It does got multiple roles, including bone health, which we well know. 
uh, but also it activates macrophages, makes them more efficient. It reduces cytokine storm through IL-10 production, uh, protects the nasal mucosa and endothelial cells from viral entry. And uh, the only known kind of beneficial treatment for COVID-19 is dexamethasone, and it has an effect on vitamin D through uh, improved vitamin D receptor transcription. So there's more receptors for vitamin D to latch onto. Uh, so that's how one of the ways a dexamethasone actually works. As you know, the healthy levels of vitamin D is between 40 60 nanomal, nanograms per mil, and under 30 is so, uh, seen as severely deficient. And a lot of patients who have been admitted to hospital with COVID-19 have severe deficiency of vitamin D under 30 nanograms per mil. Rarely you get familial predisposition to vitamin D deficiency uh, and also uh, obviously people with BAME are more likely to be predisposed to vitamin D because they don't get enough sunlight, partly because they don't go out very much, partly because they are dressed uh, to block sunlight and partly because of, uh, of, of their dark skin which uh, so compared to white people who need about 30 minutes a day of ultraviolet B, uh, darker colored skin people need a lot more than that, maybe like a couple of hours a day. Um, I'm sorry, it's, my slide is not showing very much, but uh, supplementation is uh, can be given IV, uh, but usually supplements are between 1,000 and 3,000 international units per day. The famous Dr. Fauci, uh, who never got uh, coronavirus, whereas everyone else in White House did get it, uh, he takes 6,000 intra-international units per day, unbelievably. Uh, there are uh, intravenous uh, supplementation, rapid supplementation, and uh, yeah, sorry, this slide doesn't show, but stuff called calcid calcid calcidonin, which is the active form of vitamin D, which again can be given orally, for people being admitted for COVID-19, or it can be given intravenously, along with vitamin K2, which again assists the vitamin D to get active. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Talk a bit about vaccines. Uh, next slide, please. So as you know, at the moment, there's a vaccine war going on, mainly in terms of getting uh, maximum uh, share income for the companies. So uh, that's why uh, this controversial, but I'll say it anyway, that's why uh, Pfizer came first, because they knew they were on a slight winner, but a more of a loser, uh, because they had to be, the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored, as you know, in, in extremely cold temperatures, minus 80 degrees centigrade. So rather than waiting for the others to come up, they came first and got a big boost of their uh, of their, their their share income, okay? Uh, but then it, it transpired that uh, the, there's a problem with this vaccine in that it has to be stored in minus 80, which is nigh impossible for most, most hospitals, most countries and so on. So now uh, the other vaccine groups are in the process of uh, presenting their findings. So uh, Russia said it was, what was it, 92% effective? Uh, then uh, Moderna has said it's 94% effective. I don't think uh, there's a difference between any of them. And I think uh, the percentage effectiveness relates to neutralizing antibodies as opposed to T cells, as far as I can see. So uh, my main understanding is with the Oxford vaccine, which is produced by AstraZeneca. I have no share interest in, I, I don't have any shares in AstraZeneca, neither do I have any, any particular interest in Oxford as a university. But the Oxford vaccine is uh, using a vector, uh, adenovirus, uh, which cannot replicate in human cells. The genome contains RNA coding for the SARS-CoV spike protein, the whole of the protein. Uh, animal studies were initially carried out in the States in, in, with NIHR, and the human studies were in Brazil and South Africa, but more recently in the UK. Initial preprint was on the uh, phase one animal studies mid-May, and then the Lancet article, I think it was in June, July, uh, saying that uh, this vaccine produced uh, uh, antibody response 
the neutralizing antibody response as well as the T cell response, both cyto uh, cytotoxic T cells and also the memory T cells got a boost with this uh, vaccine. The good news about this vaccine, I suspect is the same as the other vaccines coming through, is that there's no immune enhancement. Uh, there's no uh, immune enhancement. There's no uh, hyper hypersensitivity uh, among people given the vaccination. It appears to stop the virus when you are exposed to the virus. It stops the virus going into the lungs. So it uh, stops pneumonia. What we are uncertain about is the effectiveness in elderly people with uh, less potent immune reactions. And also we are not sure whether it's uh, that effective with uh, people uh, who have uh, poor, you know, who are immunocompromised. So that's the answer. Please, you, have, please you have five minutes. Yes. Five minutes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Bad news is uh, that after getting the vac uh, vaccination and then getting exposed to the, uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, there's a high nasal carriage. So anyone getting the vaccination has to carry on the same reg regulations in terms of wearing a mask, keeping your distance, and also uh, washing hands and so on. The competition is Sinovac, which is the Chinese vaccine, whole attenuated SARS-CoV-2, and Modern and Imperial, which is to do with mRNA components. Just to touch on the ethical issues, uh, vaccis, vaccination is, is the vac vaccination going to be mandatory for healthcare staff on, a, in, on emergency use? meaning that it hasn't been tested properly? The answer is probably going to be yes. Uh, is there going to be vaccine passports mandatory for air travel? Probably the answer is yes. And who pays for any bad reactions? And I suspect the answer is going to be the taxpayer. Next slide, please. Next slide. So what's the elephant in the room? Is it, next slide, please. Is it obesity? And I've rather cheekily put a picture, which is uh, editors have taken off. Next slide, please. Or oh, ROS. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I, I had a picture of Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak. As you know, Sunak is very thin and Boris Johnson is very fat. And it is Boris who got the uh, uh, infection and Rishi didn't. Uh, or is it, is it that it is not obesity, but ROS, reactive oxygen species, which is the culprit, rather than obesity per se. There's increasing evidence that obesity in itself is not particularly toxic. It is to do with ROS. Next slide, please. Go on. Yeah, yeah. next slide, please. Conclusions. So COVID-19 has taught us more non-communicable disease, which is interesting. It's this uh, infection, but taught us about ROS accumulation and how that leads to diabetes and hypertension and, you know, most likely Alzheimer's disease. We have found out a lot more about how immune system becomes dysregulated and the importance of zinc and vitamin D and steroids. I think, next slide, I think that's, that's me actually. I've uh, got various uh, references I put in. And uh, what's the next one? Next one. Next one. Next slide. Yeah. Um, if you're in for a bit of excitement, uh, if if you go back a slide, please. Yeah. Vikramasinghe. That's a that's a reference right at the top there. Uh, that's the uh, the interesting thing about how the virus can piggyback on various uh, micro particles and go up the wind system. So. Please don't blame the Chinese in terms of sending various tourists to the states and things. The infection would probably have got to the states anyway through the global wind systems. Okay, so just to give uh, poor Chinese people a break. Thank you very much. Any questions? Please, question. Have you questions? No? Thank you very much.